Well, I'm Carolyn Sachs. I'm a professor of rural sociology and women's studies and head of the Department of Women's Studies at Penn State University. Uh, most of my work focuses on women in agriculture and gender and environment issues. And I've worked in various places in the world, including in Peru, in Africa. I've worked in, in Kenya, Zimbabwe, Egypt, and I've also worked in in Asia, in Sri Lanka, in Bangladesh, India, a little bit in the Philippines. <clears throat> in many places um, where crops are grown for like maybe both subsistence and for and for market, women oftentimes have the one, have the responsibility for saving the seeds because what they're deciding are what seeds do you save for the family to eat? What, what's, what's being used as grain for the family to eat, or in this case, as tubers for the family to eat? What's, what's, what are you going to sell on the market to make money? And then on the other hand, uh, what are you going to save to plant next season? So one of the things we found, especially in study, studying women's um, involvement in seed saving, is they often choose seeds that have multiple equalities. So for example, men may be more interested in high productivity, large numbers of large grain yields, whereas women um, in some cases we found are interested in grains that have not just a high grain yield but have you know have more straw uh, because their feet they're having to take care of the livestock and, and they need the fodder. They're also thinking about the taste of the of the various varieties and the cooking qualities. You know, does it take a long time to cook it or does it take a short time to cook it? Is it good for making tortillas or is it good for, for having, making something that will, wheat that will rise? So there are a lot of things they consider when they're saving these seeds. So that, that kind of knowledge, I, I think I would call it, we call it an indigenous knowledge when we were working in the Andes, but I think that what I see is in many parts of the world is there's a combination of, of women farmers who have responsibility for feeding their families and growing food, of having knowledge that's indigenous knowledge, but also knowing more scientific and modern uh, skills too, and they oftentimes combine those kind of knowledge. In the situation of the, the crops and uh, and in, in India, where the idea was is that people would be healthier if they grew more, if they could grow more rice. And if you could give people irrigation, they could grow more rice. So they went in, did, gave money to people to, um, gave money to people to drill um, irrigation wells. They drilled the wells and people were happy that they could get irrigate irrigation water, but they really weren't necessarily asking for irrigation, but that's what was given to them. So the irrigation wells went in, now the water is gone because they used all the water, that, you know, that it hasn't been replenished, and so now the people, you know, know, have this knowledge about what crops they can grow there with less water, but, um, you know, the, the system was, the system their, their, their cropping system was really destroyed and it was then switched to this monoculture of just rice without understanding the nutritional needs of the community, the long-term needs of the community in terms of having wa access to water for a long time. So without, by not listening to what the people were already doing and building on that, but coming in with these modern development systems that grew high high intense, high demand rice that you needed water, you needed, f f uh, you needed fertilizer, you needed herbicides, you needed pesticides, that um, you kind of dis they destroyed the, the previous system. And now with climate change, higher temperatures, less water, we're having to see a resurgence of this more indigenous knowledge that because the, the, the more modern high input variety agriculture just didn't have the sustaining power over time. Well, when I was working in Swaziland, 
we were working with uh, agronomists and other agricultural scientists and they were advising the the people who were doing the agriculture to how to grow maize and have a higher yield. So they were advising people both on how to use certain kinds of fertilizer, but one of the things they saw primarily was that the women weren't weeding the crops in a timely fashion, cutting down on the, on the yield of the corn. And I, I didn't know why the women weren't doing the weeding. I mean, they, although they were overburdened with time, I just thought they weren't doing it because they had plenty of other things to do, like take care of their kids and other types of things. So I said to the agronomist, you know, they're not doing it because they're so time constrained. And then a couple years later, while we were working there, a student I was working with was studying the nutrition uh, in families and, came and told me about these two crops that these two plants that people were eating with every meal. And I, it, I didn't know what they were, so we found out and we talked some more, and I found out those two crops were what the scientists had seen as the weeds in the field, and the women were letting them grow h taller and not weeding them, not because they were lazy or because they had, didn't have enough time, but because those were plants they were using as major food to supply the vitamin A needs for their family members.